so I, I guess I, I will I will get started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Julianne Treem, and I am the TLC chair elect. Um, and I'm from North Carolina State University. And I'm sorry that I could not be there in person. Um, I'm hoping that next year, you know, I'll, I'll be able to to actually see see everyone. And I feel like I know a lot of people's um, names just from our correspondences, but not necessarily faces. So hopefully next year, um, I'll, I'll, we'll be able to do that. So welcome to our teaching tips um, session. And what we really wanted to do was highlight um, teaching award recipients that have won either the AAEA award um, or the USDA teaching award, in which uh, in 2020, um, we actually had two recipients which is, I think, kind of amazing and maybe unprecedented. So what we wanted to do was kind of share our teaching journey, um, kind of offer tips in terms of like putting together a teaching award nomination packet, kind of how do you get there? How do you kind of make the packet so that you could actually submit it somewhere? So that actually is far more stressful um, than I imagined it would be. Um, we also want to honor our graduate um, student award winners from TLC, and we also want to hear their perspective on things that they, you know, have really helped them along the way, and maybe kind of address some of the things that they they think would actually be beneficial that maybe they didn't have access to. These are things that we could sort of address in the future. And then we're also going to hear from um, Logan Britton from Kansas State University, and he's going to offer us some lessons from a first year teacher, but also a former TLC graduate student award winner. So with that, I am going to turn it over to you, Alex. Can everybody hear me? Sound is good. Excellent. Let me figure out the clicker. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know this session's name is Tips on Teaching and Learning, but I'll just share my thoughts and I'll let you decide if they qualify as tips, okay? Um, I'll talk about four things. The first three things are kind of part of my teaching journey, teaching philosophy, and then the last, I'll just share some, some thoughts about structuring or developing a package. The first thing, first thought is about the importance of um, focusing on learning when you're teaching and nothing really makes the point as well as this strip. Uh, some of you might recognize a uh, tiger and his little brother, uh, Pumpkinhead. And the Pumpkinhead says, I taught Stripe how to whistle. And the Stripe is the dog. And then the, the tiger says, but I don't hear him whistling. And then the Pumpkinhead replies, I said I told him, I didn't say he learned it. So the point is, teaching happens only when learning happens. If I walk into the classroom and I speak for another an, an hour, does it mean I taught? No, if students haven't learned anything, it means I wasted everybody's time. So the key is that the students should walk out of the classroom knowing something they didn't know when they walked in. And what I want to emphasize is that that something that they will learn has to be useful and relevant to their goals and aspirations. And it's important that they perceive that it's helpful and useful to their goals and aspirations. It's not just you telling them, trust me, it's helpful and useful. No, if they perceive that it's helpful and useful, they will be paying attention and learning, and then the teaching will happen, right? And this brings us to the next thought that I wanted to share. And this is really reflected in the wisdom of this quote. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the man and woman to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for a vast and endless sea. And the way this translates to the teaching context is that if we want to develop a good learning experience, if you want to build good learning experience, it's not enough to just gather students and lecture and give assignments and homeworks. We also need to 
inspire and motivate them to want to want to learn about the discipline that you that you're teaching so then in other words the the emphasis should be put on what from what to learn to why it is important to learn and why it is important to learn is different for every single student in the classroom you might have an idea why for example in my case agribusiness is important but each student must understand why it is important for them to learn to, to stay to stay motivated and the first assignment in my class that i give is to write one or two paragraph essay on why is it important for the students to be in this classroom and to learn the, the, the material and then they give it back and i read it helps me to understand where they're coming from and and i actually one year i just went step forward i just said instead of writing why don't you just shoot a video of yourself explaining why it is important to be here we gather those videos we stitch them together and and i want to just show share some of it with you we hopefully it plays and and everybody online can get the sound uh, This will play it. Oops. Just give it a second, it should, should work. We tried it before and it worked. We tried right before the session and it worked. So I want to study agribusiness management because to manage time, people. I'm studying ag business management because it has such a broad opportunity and it has a lot to do with our everyday lives. I want to know how to market my commodities and get the best prices for all my products. The reason behind this is because of the application of the real world. So I can be a strong leader after I complete college. So that'll mean working with people and understanding their behaviors. And it'll help me manage the family farm someday and to help run a successful agriculture insurance business. Food, farm to plate, and all the steps in between. It's much more interesting to me than just plain business. To improve my own business and my family's. I'm more interested in what goes on the business side of agriculture and also the food side. Well, I need to do an ag elective. So, I didn't know anything about ag econ, so I took the class. It was pleasantly surprised. It gave us uh, quite a lot of the concept and the theories about how to manage your the agribusiness. I plan on being a manager somewhere within agriculture. To be a manager, and I think it is important to be able to have a good relationship and understanding of your employees. To be able to stand strong for the next six generations. To cooperate, manage, and lead not only your coworkers but also your employees. Improve my leadership skills and be able to apply that to a business setting. Actual real life concepts. Apply the techniques that I learned to my classroom when I'm so I can be, one day be more diverse for my students, the future teacher. That's a really important thing to know, especially in a classroom. To learn more about the business part of the agriculture economy. Better grasp is how the markets work and how we got to continue to try to feed the world. Which is to learn good communication skills for my future employers and employees. If I can become a better manager and to just broaden my horizon horizons about agribusiness to broaden my knowledge on the way agriculture managers operate. I'm just very interested in the industry and I feel like an ideal career for me would be um, working for an ag business company. Because I have a passion for the ag industry and I wanted to learn more about how you manage a company like that. Because it ties into my home life of coming from ag and also my business major. Understanding management is important in the business world. It helps professionals in the agricultural industry uh, learn more about strategies to improve their management skills. All the content learning class will improve your professional skills. Or because I'm going to use it in the feedlot. 
to better promote agriculture to our industry and to apply the business side for our own businesses. Take it back to our cattle calf operation. To build a better future for the generations to come. Uh, to take it back to the family farm and do a better job of managing. One thing I want you to note is that the reason is different for each student. There are some of them who said similar things, but for lots of different things. One is there to learn about management. Another wants to be a better leader. Another wants to learn about markets, the supply chain. Another one, one wants to take the knowledge back to their farm and stay strong for next six generations, right? And another one wants to learn so they can communicate with their students if they they're in ag education, for example. And there's no way for me to know this, what kind of, why are they, each of them, and what, what motivates them without them revealing that. If I come in and I say, trust me, it's important, it's one thing, but if them reflecting why this might be important and then telling me, now I know how to relate to them and now I know how to connect to them to teach better. And this brings us to the next thought, the importance of human connection. And this is a quote by John Maxwell. Um, when I just started 10 years ago at Kansas State University, I approached one of our senior faculty, uh, Arlo Berry, and I said, you know, is there any advice you can give me? And he said, people will never care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that really resonated with me very strongly. And the, really the point is that of course, you know, there are many dif different definitions of human connection, but this one really reflects that human connection is the exchange of positive energy between people. It has the power to deepen the moment and the bond between people, inspire change, build trust. And I think many of you will agree that it's hard to teach without inspiring change, without building trust, without having that positive energy. So I think that it's important to have that human connection in the classroom. And just to share with you some of the, some of the things that we're doing in, in my classroom, just hopefully it reflects that, that positive energy and human connection. This is how we start the class in, 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 in my classes that I teach. This is the specific one, the Agic 318. I just walked in and I greeted everybody. If you could play it. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> This is the beginning of the class. We haven't even started having fun, you know, doing fun things. So what I really want to emphasize is that important of positive attitude, positive energy, that human connection, people feeling part of the group, and that will help build a better learning experience. So just to summarize, I want to use this analogy I picked up from some other colleagues and kind of adopted it. The, the analogy of learning like climbing a hill, the learning process, the harder the learning process, the steeper the hill. If there's no learning, then it's just flat, right? So there's no effort needed. And in the beginning of the semester, students are standing at the food hill and looking at this hill, and then they're thinking, okay, this seems tough, but should I climb it? How much effort I should put in climbing it? And they have to know in the beginning of the semester that this is worth. They need to climb this hill. It's worth it to put that effort. And that's when the motivation becomes important. Next, we talked about human connection, mutual support. Anybody who climbed the hill or studied for exam know that it's important to have that mutual support, pushing, pulling everybody up and helping each other. And then the positive attitude and the enthusiasm. And I know whether you're climbing a hill or studying, it's always more fun when you have positive attitude and have enthusiasm in the group. So then uh, I wanna wrap up with, with some advice about putting together a package. I was thinking about the award packages, but I think this applies also for the promotion and tenure packages as well. Four key points from my experience. Um, number one starts from day one of your teaching instead of when you get nominated or you up for promotion. From day one, start doing things that will ultimately build up into, into, into your package for promotion or for award. 
that if you do things from day one, when it's time to put together a package, it will be much easier. And do more than what's expected. These awards, these promotions are called outstanding teaching award for a reason, right? So make sure that whatever you put together shows the uniqueness of your teaching, the unique aspect. Make sure to go above and beyond of what's expected to stand out really in the pool of the, the other nominees. Um, number three, develop a well-rounded portfolio. Address each criteria of the award. Many awards have specific criteria, so they ask for um, teaching effectiveness, advising, um, scholarship in teaching and learning, uh, contribution to the field of teaching and learning. So think about it again from day one, do activities that fall in many different criteria that will help you have a well-rounded portfolio because you might have an excellent, excellent teaching effectiveness, but if, if your portfolio is lacking in, for example, scholarship of teaching and learning, then it won't be perceived as well-rounded. And then number four is show evidence of impact. Because if you just list things that you have done, it's just a list of things you have done. What matters, remember going back to the beginning of the presentation, teaching only happens when learning takes place. So teaching, good teaching happens when it has impact. So where is the impact? Show the impact in your portfolio and it can be both qualitative and quantitative. Some examples of qualitative impact will be quotes from your students, quotes from your peers who observe you teaching. Um, quantitative impact will be teaching evaluation scores. If you put them there, put something that they can reference, maybe the average of the department or the col college. Uh, another example of quantitative impact will be number of students that you advised, number of students who got good jobs that you advised or um, number of publications in teaching and learning that you have, have done, uh, et cetera. So, so you get the idea. So with this, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and pass it to the next speaker. Well, Alex, can you stay up just for a minute? Because I had a couple of questions um, because what you've said has just been so enormously valuable, especially about preparing um, the package part. Um, what do you think made your packet stand out? So you talked about making sure that you emphasize kind of what's unique. What do you think really makes you stand out? Yeah, um, I think w one of them is, was that it was well-rounded, so there were... I think I had enough to, to meet the requirements of each criteria, right? So I had things that showed some of the unique aspects of my teaching, which includes, you know, new things that I tried in the classroom, maybe new technologies, new approaches, and then also showing the impact. Just you say, this is what I tried and turn around and show the impact. So whether it's a student who says, oh, we actually love this, this new technique or new pro thing or, it really helped us learn. Um, so that's, that's one of them. So having, making sure it was well-rounded. The other thing is show the impact. Show, just listing things that you have done is not enough. Just make sure there's impact somehow reflected and it's credibly reflected in, in, in your package that whatever you have done had impact on somebody's learning, somebody's life. And, and if you can do that in a credible way, I think that that, that will that will help your package stand out. Hopefully this answered the question. Yes, yes, very uh, very much so. Um, just one last question for me in case there's others from the audience, because I can't see anyone from the audience, so I don't want to take up their question time. Were there any kind of professional development opportunities that you think helped you kind of evolve as a teacher? Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, I'm sure many experienced teachers and new teachers will relate. Your first semester is, you know, um, is a very, very big learning experience, right? So, so then after my first semester, I, I turned around and said, okay, what are the different ways I can improve myself? And, and I went and talked to, uh, to senior faculty in a department and we're fortunate to have many 
great, great teachers in, in our department at K-State, and I'm sure uh, there are many others in other departments, and they were so great and, and, and in giving advice and sharing the insight. So that was one thing, talk to your faculty, talk to your colleagues, senior colleagues, they'll be more than happy to help. Don't be afraid to ask, ask for advice, for help. Number two, there are a lot of uh, professional development opportunities, both in universities, you'll be surprised, but also in professional associations. I know AAEA had pre-conference workshop on, on teaching effectiveness, on specific tools and things, and I made sure to attend those. Um, and then the university offered many different workshops and events uh, for, for improving teaching and learning. My philosophy with those was if I can attend these things and learn one great insight and meet one nice, interesting person, it's worth attending, okay? Um, yeah, so talking to colleagues, to mentors, and then um, professional developments at the, at the conferences and also in the university. And then probably one thing, this is not really professional development events, but try to get as much feedback from your students as you can. Any opportunity you get, ask them how the class is going, how is it working for them, how this one assignment worked for them, did they like it, what didn't they like? Meet other people in our discipline, kind of talk about what are some of the issues that we are all facing. Um, reading teaching journals. So I think this is an underrated portion of improving your teaching. If you want to be sort of an evidence-based te teacher, you need to know what the evidence is. So the teaching journals I have found extremely important. Um, obviously, obviously we have the AETR, which is great, the Journal of Economic Education. And I also highly encourage you to look outside of our discipline. Physics, for instance, they have fantastic teaching resources as does psychology, and they will kind of approach issues from a completely different viewpoint. And I think that's, that's, also, that's also just a, a really kind of nice feature of making sure you're aware of all the different approaches. Um, again, on campus, so kind of once you kind of laid that foundation out, can you participate in a certificate program? So I know it, I'm at NC State University. We have a lot of, you know, even for graduate students, a graduate student um, teaching certificate program. And I actually did that. I went to NC State as a graduate student and I completed that there and that was immensely helpful. So if you are a graduate student, look for an opportunity like that, I think would be good. Attend teaching seminars. A lot of times, you know, if you have like an office of faculty development or like center for teaching excellence, they're all named different things, but basically the same type of things. They, they usually have tons of seminars that you could go to to improve, you know, the technology piece of your class or just sort of the, looking at the pedagogical choices that you want to make. Once you've kind of felt comfortable with that, um, try to, you know, think about leading a seminar. So you can start small, maybe just do it in your department. Here's something, you know, here's kind of a, a gap I think that we could fill. Here's how I could fill it. You know, what are your thoughts? And then from there, you can kind of go through the, the pathway of presenting on campus and then eventually, you know, going off campus. Um, you can volunteer to be on a committee, but no, do not volunteer for every committee because if you do that, it will lead to oh, just complete stress overload. When you are doing your teaching piece, you need to make sure that you are focusing on things that you are truly passionate about. I hate to overuse the word passion, but if you really do not like a certain you know, area, don't volunteer for a committee that's definitely focusing on that area. I see a lot of my colleagues sometimes in an effort to get every, you know, to touch every base, they try to do every possible thing that comes up and you really just can't, you know, you need to be a little bit more targeted. So make sure don't ever volunteer to be on a committee if you are not truly passionate about that because it can come back to just really kind of stress you out later. Um, so once you've done a few of the on-campus things, then you can move off campus, submit your papers for a publication, um, and then again, just volunteer to serve on, on, you know, either a committee or, I mean, there's all kinds of things um, in AAEA that if, you know, if you could find something probably in your, in your view house.
Okay. So you can't go for a national award until you've gotten the on-campus teaching award. I think, and this is what, what I have, I have solicited feedback on all of my packets that I have submitted to see kind of what I could improve. And they said that one of the most important points is having good letters. So you need to identify your letter writers very, very early. Um, give them as much information about you as a teacher that you think is relevant. This goes back to what Alex was talking about, about what makes you unique. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to understand about yourself. So it takes a lot of self-reflection and sometimes it takes peers evaluating you to say, hey, you know what? You do this very well. And maybe you didn't know that you did it. You know, you didn't know how good you were. Sometimes that outside feedback can kind of center, you know, what, what is my contribution? What am I particularly good at? Um, make sure that they have seen you teach or are familiar with your teaching. So they told me that a lot of people, they have these letters and they're extremely generic and they say nothing specific about teaching. The letters need to be specific in terms of identifying what your unique contributions are as a teacher. So you want to help the letter writer do that as much as possible. For a lot of the awards, even the on-campus award, as well as the USDA award, um, we had to have student letter writers. And so these were students that had just recently taken a class. This, this required a lot of help in terms of offering them a template, um, reminders of the class activities, because sometimes if it had been, you know, students in the class and then they forget about you. I mean, it's terrible to say as it is, I feel like sometimes I am, I know that they don't remember every activity that we did the following semester. So just kind of a short, you know, Zoom meeting or even an email that reminds them of, hey, here are the activities that we did. You can feel free to discuss those if you feel like it's relevant, but just reminders, because once again, you're centering them on a universal theme that outlines why you are deserving of this award, why you are outstanding. And so that's sort of what they were saying um, with the letter package, all of the letters, should really be reinforcing your universal theme of what makes you unique. And a generic letter you know, can kind of be a killer because it kind of shows that that person doesn't know as much about your teaching. So they say that the letter, write, the letter writing is probably one of the most important pieces of the packet. So definitely you know, spend, spend a good amount of time, especially if it requires student letter writers because they might, they might need a little more guidance. So you need to show that you are a leader. So how have you taken initiative? Have you seen that something, you know, something in your discipline is lacking and this is how I'm going to fill the gap? How have you shared your knowledge? Have you given seminars? Have you helped people in your department? Have you mentored graduate student teachers? Um, have you participated in your disciplines, you know, TLC section, for instance? Um, how have you demonstrated leadership on your campus? So at NC State, we have a program called Delta Fellows, and those are the faculty that use um, technology in teaching and basically rerun seminars, you know, all year demonstrating this is how you do an interactive video. These are, you know, this is how you set it up. This is what you need to look for. This is how you can use Google Jamboard to demonstrate how graphs are being drawn. You know, whatever it is, how have you demonstrated that? And then, of course, how have you mentored others in your field or on campus? That kind of goes with some of the others. But if you can answer all of these questions, then you likely have a very, very strong start to your application. Okay, CV organization. Do not just dust off your CV from a couple of years ago and then just send it in. Any award that you submit for, your CV should change based on that award. You need to emphasize what is the award looking for. I recently applied for a teaching and technology um, type position and I needed to change my CV to make sure that the technology piece was really emphasized. Whereas normally I probably wouldn't do that. So for a teaching award, if you can have research and you can have your teaching, you definitely wanna emphasize your teaching activities um, with some kind of bold, use subheadings to kind of draw the attention of the reviewers use dot points to make sure that they can see everything very clearly. Do not use abbreviations for your classes and programs. 
Um, you may know what ARE 201 is or ARE 433 is. Nobody else does, not even people in your own department. Everything needs to be spelled out. If you have one allotable boards, they very much appreciate a one to two sentence summary of what the award is. So while you might know what, you know, what was, I, so I, don't, I won an award and it wasn't necessarily clear from the title what it was. And one of the people reviewing my packet said, hey, I don't really know what this is. You probably need to just have some type of description. That's, an, that's a really important point. Um, but basically you wanna make it very visually appealing and easy to navigate. This is another thing that I think sometimes people overlook, but the CV really should change with what it is that you're actually going for. Teaching philosophy. So for me, what I think made my packet stand out the most and what I've gotten probably the most positive feedback on was my teaching philosophy. Most challenging because it does require you to know yourself very well. And it took me a long time to understand kind of what, you know, what really made me a good teacher. Because the worst thing you can do is start looking at, I think, teaching philosophy examples, because then you, you write one and it's just like all of the others. But in the teaching philosophy, you really kind of need to tell a story. Like, what is your anecdote that's illustrating your teaching philosophy? If you can find a winning anecdote that very clearly illustrates kind of what you uh, what you kind of are as a teacher, it's a perfect segue into the rest of your teaching philosophy. So if you say, I am an innovative teacher, which all of these expect you to be, so you always have to say you're innovative, even if you don't feel it. Once again, describe the challenge you faced. What did you do to address it? How did you implement it? Did it work? How can it be improved? All of these are basic steps for a teaching research paper anyway. So these are things that you should be doing. But it does require that self-reflection and it requires that, hey, you actually put a plan in place, you executed it, and then you thought about, hey, these results didn't work. I looked at the stats on this and the intervention was not effective. Or I looked at the stats on this and the intervention was effective. That means that now I have a, kind of a foot in the door in order to make a contribution. So these are the things that the teaching philosophy needs to really, really drive home. Don't use buzzwords without backing it up. So I, they told me that a lot of people do the teaching philosophy and every buzzword you can think of is used in the teaching philosophy and none of them are expanded upon in anywhere else in the application. Don't put something in your teaching philosophy that's not in the rest of your packet. It all needs to have a very universal theme. This is me, this is what I believe. This is, this is what I do in my class. All of it needs to have a central theme. So don't say you use problem-based learning and then you never mention it again in the whole packet. That's a sign that possibly, you know, you, you've kind of used a buzzword. Um, be honest, be authentic and back it up. I think it's this, here's my evidence of this. This is what happened when I did this. I do think it's important if you kind of start, a, start as an outline with your teaching philosophy, what is the specific award? What is it concentrating on? Obviously, those are the things that you're going to want to hit hard on your teaching philosophy. So starting with that outline, I think is good. If you have those letters of support to read before you complete your statement, that will help you have a unifying theme. And obviously, you want to make sure that you know exactly what's going in those letters in terms of, you know, doing all the other parts. Because once again, if somebody's mentioned, oh, they do, you know, they do all of these experiments in class, then you also want to mention the experiments. You want to reinforce it. Make sure you are addressing award requirements. Just because you put a packet in for an on-campus award does not mean that you can submit the same packet for an off-campus award. For the USDA award that Alex and I won in 2020, they told me that there were numerous applications that they rejected because the margins were not correct because they had not followed the editing and the font requirements. It's, it, it, it's that crucial that you follow every single thing. And so I remember going over that packet, I don't know how many times to make sure that I had not done anything incorrect. And then as Alex said in his presentation, edit, edit, edit. Have a, you know, have a lot of people read your teaching philosophy, you know, make sure that it makes sense 
make sure that it's kind of, you know, you haven't kind of copy and pasted from one and then put it in another. And sometimes when you do that, you think you're going to save a lot of time, but then it doesn't flow very well. So make sure that it is edited as much as possible. So that's, sorry. Was Kristen, were you going to say something? No, all good to you. Okay, sorry, I, I heard a I heard a blip on my end and I didn't know. Sorry about that. Okay. Teaching effectiveness. Do not rely solely on your teaching evaluations for evidence of your teaching effectiveness. So this is not news to anyone. Everyone that is applying for teaching award has relatively high teaching evaluations. That's not going to distinguish you. That's not going to really put you ahead of anyone else. Everybody's kind of going to be on the same ballpark. I don't really even know why they ask for them because of that reason. If you are in fact applying and you've gotten all of the letters of support, there's a pretty good chance that those teaching evaluations are going to be quite high. And of course, there's always concerns with the bias associated with those as well. So what do you do to supplement that? Because everyone asks for it, so you do have to do it. Peer reviews. If you are a graduate student, have someone come in and review your class for you. There's all kinds of forms available from your department. They come in, they, they do a form, they write a little letter for you, and you have a peer review to supplement your teaching effectiveness evidence. Unsolicited comments from students. At NC State, we have a thank a teacher anonymous kind of submission award from students. And I have gotten some of my most used comments in my award packets from this particular program. So any type of the comments that are coming from something other than just the written part of the student evaluations, I think is good. Um, do a statistical evaluation of the intervention that you did in your class. So for instance, if you, you know, if you implemented interactive videos in your class and you have determined that statistically this actually yielded much better exam scores, that is actually evidence hey, this is, this is a teaching effectiveness evidence because I researched, I decided what the issue was, I did it, and then there was a positive outcome from it. Um, the student comments based on the intervention. When you do the intervention, you almost always do kind of some kind of survey. That survey would be a really good inclusion as well. Um, comments made during your performance reviews or even from promotion referees, all of these are um, additional teaching effectiveness outlets that I think some people kind of forget about. They're, they're probably more important than just looking at your, at your numbers. So applying for the National Teaching Award. Once you kind of got it on campus, the best thing you can do is start to apply for National Teaching Awards if you think that you're qualified as soon as you can because you've already done a lot of the hard work. And so you will be able to use some of it in the next application. So you want to kind of go through. Um, if you win the USDA teaching award, you get this really nice apple. I'm like terrified that one of my children's going to throw it down. I have it way high, but you just never know. But you get this little apple. Um, it's kind of neat. So the application process itself is, I I found to be much more intense than what I had to do in my on campus, especially you know, they put the fear in me that my application would get tossed if I didn't do like one element of it. Um, but follow the guidelines. Don't repeat yourself. Don't copy and paste from one section to another because they do know. And then basically you just have to show that you're a leader nationally in teaching and learning. And just because, you know, you have some of this doesn't mean that you don't continue to kind of improve as you move along. Um, so Kristen, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to you because I know we have a couple other people. And I Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Do we have questions for Julian from the audience here, the live audience? Carlos? Um, thank you, Dr. Trim, for your presentation. And um, so you mentioned uh, when you're when, that you're when you're developing a teaching philosophy that you have to be unique. So what do you think that makes you unique from others in your same discipline? So in, in terms of the award packet, I think my teaching philosophy definitely made me unique because in everyone um, that I talked to, they said, 
they remembered mine. And it's because I started out with an anecdote from uh, my dad. Uh, my dad and grandmother actually went to the University of South Carolina at the same time. My grandmother was 49 and my dad was 19. And they were both in a French class. And my dad, once they took attendance, he actually would jump out of the window because he, the attendance had already been taken. So he would jump out of the window as my grandmother sat up front and diligently took notes. So I sort of use that as there are so many different learning styles and my dad, you know, became very like a productive citizen. You know, he has a very respected position in the community, but kind of close to what Alex was saying, that human connection, you have to figure out why are they, you know, why are they there? What are they going to learn? And how can you kind of make them motivated? And I think I do those things really well. But I think the teaching philosophy really made me stand out. Thanks for your for your answer. Very insightful. I have another question if if I can make it. So so you mentioned that when you started, so you have some evaluations that were not as good as you have now. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that your teaching style have evolved or has evolved uh, for that to happen? So when I started, I was very rigorous and I came from like an undergrad program and, and it was, it was rigorous. There was, you know, it, it, a lot was required. And so initially in my teaching career, I required a lot but I did not necessarily deliver everything that they needed in order to do that. And I didn't know it, obviously. I was always doing the very best that I could. But sometimes you don't really know um, how much you need to improve until you've seen a video of yourself. And so I had someone video me, and I was like, oh, it, it's just terrible. Like, I don't like to hear my voice, but even, like, watching te me teach, it was very painful. But I learned so much from that. And in terms of like the evolution of it by watching, by watching sort of my mannerisms in class and watching how I say certain things or my facial expression, sometimes I didn't smile as much. And I'm not saying you just need to smile and you're a great teacher, but you can't look so grim. Like we're already a dismal science. You can't add to it with your facial expression the whole time. And there were just, there were small things like that that I think helped me. But I think the evidence-based teaching, reading the teaching journals and saying, oh, look, it looks like, you know, this, this type is actually working. And I really like how they did this experiment. Or in AETR, I know there was a case study on government cheese. And I read that and I did that. And I was like, this is, a, this is great. It, like, works very well in the class. I think those things made me a lot more effective. It's just kind of the presentation of myself but also making sure that I was giving them enough opportunities to practice on the level that I expected them to perform. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, for this response. Do we have a question also on our uh, Zoom? Julian, do you see any questions online? Um, wait, is this the Vimeo one or the other one? I'm sorry. Hang on, I've got all these, let me get my presentation now. I don't see anything. All right, good. So we will uh, move on and maybe I introduce the yes. two next speakers because we are back uh, here in the room and then we will hand over to you to introduce our last speaker that is back uh, virtually to manage this. So I'm really excited uh, to introduce two speakers. Uh, first, uh, starting with April Atos, which is the first uh, of our uh, awardees this year for our teaching, learning and communication uh, graduate uh, student teaching award. And because it was an unusual year, uh, we didn't only have two uh, prizes that we gave out, we actually had three prizes that we gave out in our third um, Avadi can't be here today and we will have all of our um, teaching award winners actually have their videos also on our section available, but we have two of them live here and I'm excited to hear what uh, April has to share with us and then we will also have um, another presentation after that. So April, the stage is yours. 
Hello, greetings, good afternoon. My name is April Athnes, and I'm a PhD candidate at Michigan State University. And uh, thank you for this honor to be able to share some of my experience um, and some of the things that I have done to be the instructor and teacher that I am today. So just to give you a little bit of background about who I am, I hail from a family of educators. Both my grandparents were high school English teachers, and to this day, I am nervous to write emails to my grandmother because I write like I speak, and that is not great English grammar. Um, I actually started my undergraduate education as a special education major. So there was an extreme pivot <laughs> from special education to economics, political science, and math, but I've always carried with me some of the lessons that I learned during that first year that I was taking um, elementary and special education classes. The first time that I formally was given a classroom was as a TA at the University of Colorado, and um, I was leading recitations, and it was a nice transition into getting to have a little bit of independence and flexibility. But when I got my master's degree, then I was afforded the opportunity to actually be the instructor of record and oversee TAs and um, start out with principles of microeconomics. And that was a really great thing for me to practice on. Uh, I am finishing the last of five semesters teaching ecological economics at MSU. So uh, I am proud to say I won't be teaching this next year because I will be on the job market, but I've taught quite a bit at MSU. The first tip that I have through my experience is that one of the best things you can do is build community as an educator. So it is very rare for MSU AFRI graduate students to teach, which means that I didn't have a community inside of my own department of other graduate instructors, and I had to look outside. So luckily, our graduate school has lunch and learn opportunities two times a month, and I attend those, and we go through different pedagogical resources. A lot of the people there are in um, higher adult learning and education, which is a program in our school. Um, and a lot of them actually came out of elementary education backgrounds, and they are phenomenal. Um, I, I love seeing how their approach is to teaching children and how very applicable it is to teaching adults. And it's not shocking. We learned how to learn through that style, and um, that's really turned us into the learners we are today. Uh, so I love to participate in these workshops and really think ahead about future semesters based on conversations that I've had with people in other departments and other practices that others have, have put into place. And one of the best guys I've met through one of these is actually in biology and there is great pedagogical resources for biology educators, and I steal their stuff all the time. It is, uh, it is phenomenal. Another thing that I highly recommend, both for your student sanity and for your own, is to set very clear expectations. This starts with, what do you expect the students know walking in the door? Um, we often talk about this in terms of prerequisites, but I think it's very important to communicate early on that it's okay if you don't remember. <laughs> So I'm teaching ecological economics right now, and many students these days are qualifying for their microeconomics prereqs based on AP microeconomics courses. And it's been a few years before they get back into ecological economics. And so uh, I really reinforce to students that here's where we're going. We're going to start slow, but you need to come talk to me immediately if you think that you're a little rusty. I'll get you there, but we have to go together. Know yourself and know your limitations. I also have really started warning or previewing how long I expect something to take for students. At the beginning of each week, I will say, here is how long the lecture videos will be because I've been asynchronous during the pandemic. Um, and here is all of your required content. And based on however many words per minute of reading. This is how long you can anticipate to spend reading your required content, listening to podcasts, watching videos. I really respect the time constraints that my students have, and that means providing useful, relevant information about time budgeting. Um, the other thing that I learned from some of my um, colleagues through Lunch and Learns is when students get very frustrated and stop engaging when they don't understand why you're putting them up to the task. So in terms of what Alex was saying about making it relevant, why did you design your course this way? 
why are you having them read this content and why are you assessing their understanding and their learning using the tool that you chose to learn uh, to, to use. So I think that just being open and transparent and allowing the students to know that you are a co-creator and here is why you're guiding them that way is a very important thing. And then just in terms of expectations for your students, I, I always joke, I say I have a young son, I have a family, and I'm old and go to bed early. Because uh, at least relative to them, I certainly am going to bed much earlier than they are. So I don't answer emails overnight. I'll, I'll answer you in the morning, but if you wait until the evening, I won't be available. But I'm happy to set up a time to talk to you during normal business hours. Um, so setting boundaries, but then holding up those boundaries. So I don't answer in the evening, even if I do have the time. Why? Because I said I wasn't available. And if I said I wasn't available, I have to prove that I wasn't available and really hold up my end of the bargain. One of the most uh, important things that I've come to realize as an educator is that we want to reward learning. We don't want to penalize things that are peripheral to learning. So this, um, many of my students do not learn the way I learned. Many of my students do not reflect their learning the way I reflect my, earn, my learning. I'm a very active participant, sit in the front row, turn my work in early or ahead of time, um, go, go, go kind of student. I have a lot of students who are not like that, and that is perfectly fine. And I've had to realize that the signs that I show are not the signs that other students show. And I've really wondered to myself, what am I rewarding? And so I really try to strip things back and ensure that I am rewarding learning outcomes, not uh, what they wore when they were presenting, not um, whether or not it is in perfect paragraphs or expressed in uh, with perfect punctuation. Why? Because that is not the learning outcome. I didn't set that forth and that is not fair to evaluate them on after the fact. So I'm really looking for marginal benefit equals marginal cost and solving market failures. <laughs> so if, it's, if that is being communicated, two big thumbs up, the rest of it has to get shelved. And I have to humble myself enough to realize that, you know, um, everyone presents in different ways and we want to reward learning outcomes, not being the status quo or being like me because everyone should certainly not be like me. And then finally, my, um, through the pandemic, the biggest thing that I have learned, and perhaps as I come into my own as an instructor teaching for several years now as a graduate student instructor, is I started hard. I was, I believed that there was such a thing as an ironclad syllabus. And if I, if I planned well enough that um, there, there would be no reason to grant exceptions or, um, that I wouldn't have to be flexible anymore. And I would be able to pound the syllabus and say, look, see here, it's, it's outlined. Um, and I think as I've just kind of softened with experience, it's been good for me and for my students. It was actually much more stressful to try to toe the line and hold to the rules than to be flexible and acknowledge the challenges that people were having. Um, an ironclad syllabus does not recognize that family members and friends contracted COVID and died. And to not respect that for a student, to acknowledge their pain and to help them navigate it so that they can still learn is, is a slap in the face, in my opinion. So I really think that practicing radical empathy, really saying, I'm a human being, I'm struggling too, um, but I'm showing up for you and here's how I'm showing up for you is just, paramount. And I, Alex has said this, and you really do have to show you care. And I do care. And that's why I teach in the first place. I like the human connection. And I really think that it is, um, personally, I think that in AgiCon, we have comparative advantage in caring about our students and connecting to their everyday lives. And I really think we should keep that comparative advantage and keep showing people that this is where they should be. They belong and we want them along for the ride because of their experiences and who they are. So discerning who they are, what they need, and then just making sure that together you're co-creating learning, I think is, is what it's all about. So um, that has been my experience thus far, and I'm sure in future years there will be much, much more, but thank you so much for allowing me to share 
this part of my journey thus far. Do we have a question right away uh, for April? We also have uh, time for question at the end when, once we have all of the presentations, but do we have uh, one immediate question for April before we move on? Alex? Um, thank you so much for your presentation. April, it was very insightful as well. So uh, my question is, uh, my question is that so every time that we get like a, a new challenge, let's say teaching a class or something like that, so there are some there there are some uh, fears or anxieties. So, so could you please tell us something about that or one experience that that you have? Yeah. So something that I have done in the last two semesters that I had never done before is actually be very open to changing assessments. So one thing. I think rigidity and saying it is set, um, while that might make expectations clear, I think we have to be flexible enough to acknowledge and be humble enough and not just have your blood pressure shoot through the roof when something wasn't done in an optimal way. So for example, uh, this summer semester, I had a student who um, she on paper was able to graph everything perfectly and she couldn't type it in for an online assessment on time. The student learned everything was on a picture that she shared with me after the fact. She just didn't have time to type it in. So I changed to the next assessment. If you don't have time to type it into the box, send me a picture within five minutes of the exam time finishing. Everyone's scores went up. Like they were demonstrating their knowledge. It was just that there was a technological impediment where it was taking time to type in the formulas even though they wrote it out on paper. And I, I thanked the student for bringing it up and say, I said, you know what, this, you feel like it's just you. It's not just you. And you're actually an advocate for yourself and your fellow students. And I think that both that student and I, and hopefully everyone else walked away from the situation feeling like, oh, we're doing something together. It's not, it's not set in stone. And so um, if it's in the favor of the students, I always say like, go for it even if it means um, tweaking a little bit of what wasn't on the syllabus. Thank you. Thank you again, April. Um, with that, I think we're going to move uh, for our, to our next presenter. And again, it's my honor again. This is our second recipient uh, of our Graduate Teaching Award. And I'm uh, happy to present Emiliano Lopez Barrera to you uh, with uh, his perspective and his teaching tips. Okay, thank you. Thank everybody to, for coming here. My name is Emiliano Lopez Barrera. I am kind of in a transition. I just got my PhD from Purdue University and I'm moving. I'll be joining uh, Texas a and uh, in fall. So uh, I hope uh, in this new position, I will have uh, the possibility to keep um, the path on, on my teaching so far. Uh, I had this, um, when I got this uh, award and, and one of the requirements was to prepare this five minutes, 10 minutes presentation. I, I wasn't sure what to do uh, exactly to not repeat many of the things that I was sure <laughs> someone else was going to say. So I tried to make something pr pretty specific on my own experience of uh, teaching uh, economics uh, to non-economists. Um, that's like uh, most of my recent experience in teaching, particularly in, in Purdue University, has been about that. We have been, I have been working a lot with uh, Dr. Thomas Hertel in, in a course that is um, uh, seeking to uh, explain these uh, forces in the global food system, how that is affecting uh, the environmental and the nutrition security. And that um, uh, drags uh, students from many uh, other uh, parts of the campus, uh, from many other disciplines. So we have this uh, extra challenge of uh, explaining economic concepts to non-economists. And that's kind of the, the hardcore of the presentation today. So uh, let me uh, frame a little bit uh, my work on, on some of these current trends on the global food system that are uh, not only shaping our daily uh, basis life, but also I 
think the way uh, as we as economists are addressing these type of questions, uh, we are uh, posing and present levels of stresses on natural resources. Our lands, waters, and airs have never been so polluted before. And that's, I mean, we know that uh, the global food system underlies uh, most of these uh, big challenges. Responding to that, the uh, United Nations has developed these uh, global sustainable development goals. Uh, and we know uh, some things that could work to help uh, to reach us uh, to more sustainable pathways towards the, the mid-century. But what we know, don't know exactly, uh, and we're still working on, is how these solutions fit together. And that's uh, kind of where our work is being like uh, niched. Uh, particularly, um, the way we address this type of uh, research usually implies uh, that we have to borrow uh, from other disciplines and uh, that have been um, leading to a, an increased uh, growth in, in this type of courses as the one that we are teaching that are aiming to uh, address questions in an interdisciplinary manner. Uh, of course, uh, this has an extra challenge, right? Uh, making this collaboration across disciplines uh, is not always easy. Uh, sometimes it, it can feel that we are talking, uh, we are having different languages. We are speaking, we, our, our wording is different. Our Some words and concepts may, may um, uh, imply different um, things depending on the, which discipline uh, you are talking. So it's, 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 it's always very challenging to do that. But uh, uh, in the other hand, these things, once you are able to bridge uh, uh, some, uh, some connections with people from other disciplines, well, that brings the, the extra value of having uh, other visions that may enrich what economists may do by their own. Uh, by their own. So there are some things uh, that are extra challenging, as I mentioned, uh, when you try to uh, teach this type of uh, concepts to, to non-economists. And through my, through my years of experience, I have learned like a couple of <laughs> uh, pretty important lessons. It's always um, uh, key to endeavor to maintain the economic concepts really simple. Uh, when we are talking with other people in our, in our own fields, it's easy to uh, um, overlook uh, simple um, simple concepts when you're trying to deal uh, and teaching economics and interacting, communicating with people from other disciplines, it's key to focus in all these little details, explaining little uh, concepts, elasticities or substitution effects. These little concepts that you may not explain for grad students that are coming with an economic background, well, you have to do these things when you are doing that. So in order to be able to uh, meet these uh, extra challenges, I have found that it's key also to plan ahead. That gives you an extra room to accommodate for unexpected questions or situations. Have an example, um, last semester, uh, due to the COVID outbreak, we started the class uh, in a normal basis in, in person, then in the middle of that, we had to transition towards uh, an online course. So the course was half of it um, in person, half of it virtual. And yeah, I mean, we had to transition while we were doing that. If we didn't have all the materials and everything planned ahead, that, that situation would have been impossible. I guess many of you uh, probably had a similar experience with different courses. But for us, planning ahead was critical in that in that sense. Uh, another thing that is uh, also particularly important when you deal with students that are coming from different backgrounds is to provide a lot of feedback on their work uh, in very short cycles. Like these interactions in short cycles are, are critical uh, to make sure that everybody is being able to follow the path in the course. Um, it's really easy to, to overlook stuff. So it's always important to come back and see how they are doing in very short cycles. Uh, 
course, promoting constructive criticism and team working. That's kind of the huge advantage of having people from different disciplines. You have a lot of smart people from different, with different skills and backgrounds. If they can teamwork, uh, that can create like a great, great stuff. Uh, we also put a lot of emphasis on hand-on assignments that are based on real world problems. Uh, we try to update this as, as the world is changing, of course, in, the, in these challenges. It's, it's really important that they get familiar with the things that we are talking about. So it's, uh, yeah, that have been working really well for us as well. And finally, uh, least but not last, uh, I mean, this is an advice that I would do to any grad student that is starting in this teaching uh, experience, well, find yourself a great mentor. I mean, that, I think that's for every other aspect on, on your uh, grad student's life, that's, that's critical as well. But particularly for teaching, it, it's, it's uh, very important. In my experience, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've been working with Dr. Herten and seeing uh, this professor, a senior professor with all this huge trajectory, being caring that much and being so passionate with the students that I will, uh, of course really resonated with me and I try to replicate that and I will try to keep replicating that in the future as well. Uh, so that's probably the most important part that I, that I, um, I don't know, if I had a, one advice to give to other students would be like find yourself a great mentor from the beginning. That's, that's very, very important. Uh, so thank you and I would like to go for the questions. Thank you, Emiliano. Do we have questions in the room? Luis? Actually, I wanted to have uh, one comment if I could actually give a, an advice for the future to all of you. And actually both of you actually addressed something that I, want, uh, I was thinking during the pandemic and actually with my classes. Um, so for, for my material and what I had to do for, I like to always have a plan B in, in, in the worst case scenario, something can happen. <laughs> so all of my classes, when I used to be 16 weeks, I actually created the material for 14. So for some reason, if I'm able to finish the 14 weeks, then I could have a special units to, for the last two weeks or to give review sessions and, and reinforcement for the students. But if something, happen, like for example, we had a hurricane in Florida and then the pandemic, those two weeks gave me enough time to already give them some weeks for them to accommodate to any new changes. So far, it was really successful because my students didn't feel the transition. And actually that is uh, something that it really, I was really happy that they didn't feel that pressure because they told me, Dr. Lewis, you actually did a good job. That, uh, <laughs> uh, that I didn't, actually, I, I was feeling stressed because of my other classes were pushing the assignments at last minute and actually you, you gave us like one more week. And I said, actually, it was, it was not that I was giving you actually one more week, actually <laughs> I was taking one from the end. So that is the only thing, um, I think that's one of the things that I learned um, because when I went to Florida at the beginning, I faced a hurricane in the first week that I went there. And that's actually kept in my mind. Like, what could I do if that happens again? And it <laughs> happened every year, something new happened. So. That is the only the advice, advice that I wanted to give. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, I kind of laterally mentioned that with the, having an idea of planning ahead, like having extra uh, extra models to teach, that's a, a way to do it. Always give you the chance to accommodate to unexpected stuff. So yeah, that, that has been working pretty well for me. And I will definitely uh, advise someone planning to start teaching advice that to do yeah that's really valuable advice there's always uh, it seems like there's always some kind of disaster every semester and we keep not teaching. knowing so what is going to happen next semester yeah. Tell us your yes um Emiliano, thank you so much for your presentation and your insights so you mentioned or and you highlighted that it is uh, very important to find a great mentor so can you share one of the greatest advices that you that you have received from from your men mentor. Well, the, the I I would say that the thing that impacted me the most is 
seeing him in action in, in a daily basis, the way he interacts with the students, like undergrad students or, or masters, PhD students, uh, how passionate he is in the teaching, that again, as I say, that really resonated with me. And yeah, it's, uh, it's probably something uh, that you can, I don't know, uh, try to imitate but it it, can, it has to be with you I, i'm kind of in the same um i'm i don't know in the same page on in our research um, um interests in, 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 at least um, that's the way i feel about it and that helps also a lot uh, so uh, i think we made a, a good matching uh, in in the research arena and then because of the class is really connected to the thing that i work that that makes yeah that made the, the situation pretty well for both of us but the way again the way he interact with the students the way he cares about the students i think that was mentioned before uh, that really resonated with me because you would think that someone with a lot of trajectory may has not that much time to deal with little stuff but it's a case that he cares a lot i guess and yeah i hope i can do the same uh, in yeah in my teaching career thank you thank you again emiliano we will have a little bit more time at the end for questions we have one more presentation and i want to hand it back over to julian because our last presentation is uh, virtual but then we have all of our presenters um for another round of questions after that so our next presenter is Logan Fritton, and he is a former uh, TLC graduate teaching award winner, winner, and he is going to offer some of his insight um, on lessons from first year teaching. Take it away, Logan. Thank you, Julie, and um, welcome from Manhattan. Can everybody hear me out there? Kristen? Yes, you're all good to go, Logan. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I'm the kind of teacher where I like to kind of leave as students a little bit early, so we're kind of running low on time, so I'm going to try to go with some cliff notes on some of these. Um, but I am an assistant professor at Kansas State University. Um, I got my PhD at Oklahoma State University. I was very fortunate to get a full year of teaching under my belt as an instructor of record for one of our quantitative classes down there. Um, and so coming, uh, my experience as transitioning from a graduate student to being an assistant professor, a lot more prep. So I have an 80-20 split versus teaching and research. Um, so I spent a lot of my time uh, in PowerPoint last uh, academic year uh, prepping for classes and completely um, getting that content ready. So my best piece of advice is to lean on mentors, maybe those predecessors who might have some of those notes or content where you can kind of mix and match and kind of make it your own. Uh, because you have a lot of uh, things to do other than being a teacher your first year as a, a professor, as a instructor. Um, as it's said time and time again, um, keep trying new things, try new innovations. I've tried um, different assessments. I um, was going to talk about all three of these um, a little bit, but um, I'll talk about time quizzes because we're short on time. Um, so in my computer decision class, um, teaching our freshman agribusiness and agricultural economics students about Excel, um, I would have thought it was great. I was going to say my predecessor let them do open note quizzes and do all this this and over a weekend. And I said, well, if you really want to be good in Excel, you got to do it. And like you're able to do these things within a couple of minutes. So I started to do time quizzes with them. It did not go over well from the very beginning. So even my top notch students would only complete two out of the five tasks that I gave them. Um, so I kind of had to reassess and learn um, with them. So by the end of the semester, I got the, the content right, as well as the timing. Um, so really, you got to put yourself out there and try things and take risks. Um, kind of like what Alex is saying, you're not, um, students aren't going to know, oh, care what you're saying unless they know you actually care about them. And so I want to take a little bit further um, that we need to continually to learn and kind of innovate ourselves as teachers because we do want to show that passion um, for them and why they're spending thousands of dollars in tuition um, to get a good job and, of course, make an impact in society. Um, so if we continue to use yesterday's teaching methods, we're going to be robbing them up tomorrow. So a really great uh, quote from John Dewey. Um, so some of my, again, kind of going really fast on some of these, uh, some of my teaching tips is kind of have the end in mind. 
Um, I took a um, teaching class at Oklahoma State, and they made us do a course outcomes map. And so um, I've done that with my classes here at K-State. Um, so going through the student learning objectives and saying, well, why are these things important? So um, most of our students are not going to be going to get their master's and PhD. So theory is great, but how are they going to use this in their everyday jobs? And so thinking about those and having that end in, the, in mind. Um, also having great resources. Um, so like our teaching award winners, um, our, under, our graduate teaching award winners have said, find really great mentors. Um, in your department, especially if you're a new faculty member, um, your department might have a formal mentoring program, um, or you can even, if you know the department, like I got my bachelor's and my master's at K-State, so I luckily know most of my colleagues, and so go and talk to them and kind of um, shoot ideas off each other and see what uh, works for them, what didn't work for them, and build that network. Of course, there are different teaching and learning centers across um, different universities. There are named um, a, a slew of different things. At Oklahoma State, it was the institution, Institute for Teaching and Learning Excellence. At K-State, it's a teaching and learning center. So um, get in touch with those, um, those centers. Um, they have some kind of visual, have some kind of professional development series or program that you can go through if you want um, to better your teaching. Um, another plug I have, um, besides the AAEA resources that we have, is the North American Colleges and Teachers of Agriculture. Um, and so being involved in that organization, um, they have different webinars and resources as well um, for college professors. Um, but the biggest thing I think that uh, when I was charged, um, charged to whenever I got invited to speaking is developing that packet. Just because I'm fresh off that job market, um, and secured a job, uh, luckily through the, the pandemic, um, putting that packet together. So um, make sure you read the job description because you might just um, think that's a great um, split, like it's your dream split and everything, but you've got to read the fine tuned details. Um, and especially those human resources um, qualifications, I've served on a couple of screening um, committees already at K-State and they will go line by line of those qualifications and say, does this person meet it, meet this qualification? And kind of what's that range of, this is really low quality or this person's above average or excellent. And so there are some objective um, things within um, applying for jobs. Um, ask about the appointment split um, at different institutions, that split's gonna be different. Um, so Oklahoma State, I remember whenever I applied for one of their teaching jobs, um, the teaching split was, um, I think, it was 100% teaching, but that uh, equated out to like I think eight classes a year. Uh, whereas my teaching employment here at K State of 80% is only four classes per year. So it changes. So you might love teaching a lot, but teaching eight classes through an academic year is um, gruesome. So be thinking about those things whenever you're applying for jobs. Um, Julianne talked a great um, length about the teaching philosophy, but make sure you have that developed. Talk to your major professor, talk to some really great. Uh, faculty members um, within your department um, about their teaching philosophy um, and of course having um, a really great um, student evaluations is always um, a great asset to have in that packet um, so here's a little snippet of mine i don't like what the university produces um, so i kind of make a summary of my own things and so i have a kind of a table of um, kind of some key evaluations and then student comments below that and then at the end i usually put the university ones um, just so that they can see the whole, all the metrics of them, but kind of giving them a highlight of what you know, the student teaching evaluations are going to be like. Um, if you do a teaching demo, um, I'll ask all your questions beforehand. What is this teaching demo going to look like? Are you going to be in front of graduate students? Or are you going to be in front of um, undergraduate students? Or are you going to be in front of faculty members? Like, who is all attending this session? Um, is it going to be um, online or is it going to be in person? Um, all those kind of fine tuned details. Uh, get, before, uh, get the details beforehand because you don't want to go to your teaching demo and completely uh, be ambushed of what you weren't prepared for. Um, and definitely engage with the audience. Um, we've talked about um, time and time again in this session of having that passion for students. Um, so that passion might be talking to them beforehand or after the session, um, maybe using some polling software, like I use Poll Everywhere in my classes and to kind of gauge um, student slots. Um, so of course these millennials and Gen Zers love their phones. And so that's the only time I allowed them to bring their phones out. 
Um, and then, um, of course, practice. Um, practice in front of your peers, uh, major professor, those on your committee. Um, of course, the department wants you to get a job because it makes them look good. So if you, um, of course, get those apartment resources um, and get your dream job going, um, they're definitely going to want you to be the best uh, candidate for the position. Um, prepare for questions, of course. Practice those questions. Um, whenever I interviewed for my faculty positions, I wrote, uh, wrote out a question and then wrote a paragraph on my response. So whenever I got asked um, by the search committee those different questions, I was really prepared uh, for those things. And so everyone's going to have a different experience. Uh, but my biggest piece of advice, if you learn anything from this um, session, um, or I guess my tips, is use the STAR method. Um, so this, if you haven't heard um, Gallup Strength Finder, um, there's um, this notion of past, um, past behaviors predict future outcomes. And so you want to kind of organize your thoughts in this STAR um, approach. And so situation, task, action of uh, results. And so kind of situation task, given the details of what's going on, paint on the picture, but the most important um, aspect of that framework is action and result. What did you do specifically? And what was the outcome because of your action? And so I was able to provide um, some of those questions of, hey, how did you engage with those students who didn't really want to come to class, had poor grades? And so I was able to give them specific responses of, hey, I had this student, Reagan, who never came to class, I emailed her a bunch of times saying, hey, if you don't come to class, your grade's gonna reflect, and she started showing up. So, of course, that's very short, um, sweet answer, but of course, gave it more detail later. Um, so just use that STAR approach, um, and that, that's a great tool for not only um, interviewing for faculty positions, but if you're going into industry as well. Um, don't be afraid to admit mistakes, and so um, share some of your teaching uh, mistakes and say the things that you've learned from them and things that you hopefully going forward uh, will improve upon. Um, I always have those what if slides ready. If you think in your research portion of your, um, your presentation, you're going to have some questions from really hard faculty members that do are experts in those fields, um, maybe additional tables or definitions, what have you. Always have those, have those in your back pocket. It, um, because those are really great um, to have and shows that you really prepared and thought about all the questions and all the possibilities. Um, and then also think about your vision, um, what you want to do specifically in that faculty role, short term and long term. So um, they want, of course, to hire somebody who's going to fit the best in their department. And kind of what do you vision yourself in that role? What are your uh, kind of short term objectives of bringing um, some research programs and excellence in teaching and as well as long term whenever you're going to get tenure what is your um, what is your role what is your um, what is your role as a faculty member going to look like even after you got tenure so short sweet to the point so I will answer any questions if you guys have Thank you. Thank you, Logan, for that presentation. Uh, and we have uh, time for just a few more questions. Uh, and they can be questions for uh, Logan or for anybody in the audience. April actually has her first question. So, Logan, what's been the biggest difference between being a graduate instructor and being a tenure track instructor? I would definitely say the time to prep has definitely changed. I mean, at OSU, I had prep for only one class and now I have to prep for two classes each semester. So I'm um, completely different ball game uh, in terms of total number of students, um, emails I'm getting in my inbox and those sorts of things. So definitely allocate your time efficiently. Um, I always like to say, uh, I told my students after 8 p.m. I stopped being a professor. And so if they have, like you said in your um, seminar or just your presentation in April is you don't answer emails. So um, kind of really thinking about that um, as I'm um, just recently married and trying to split that work and personal life balance. Thank you. Do we have another question? Well, with that, maybe we will uh, conclude our session for today. And I just wanted to uh, thank all of our presenters. 
despite still being completely exhausted from this last year of teaching, you all succeeded in somehow making me excited about starting all over again here. Uh, and so I think I speak for everybody in the room that this is why we all teach. And uh, I will probably close with uh, the way Alex said it. And that is really, um, as if, if you students don't know that you care, it's really going to hard to convince them that you know something that is relevant or inspire them in terms of teaching. And it was very evident and very clear how much all of you cared. And thank you again for sharing all your teaching advice.